William Gargan stars as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. There's a big house up the river that always has the welcome mat out, folks. Just drop in. Any old crime. The National Broadcasting Company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Barry Craig speaking. The streamlined confidential operator keeps a case file with a nod to police regulations and with an eye to posterity. A book of memoirs someday, you figure, to show your grandchildren you were full of hustle yourself once upon a time. You keep a well-detailed file. Case number so-and-so, the nature of the crime, the principal actor, the outcome. And page one stating by who and just how were you pulled into the felony in the first place. Take the file in my hand right now. Numbered 113. Who asked me into the case reads, Father Neptune. Father Neptune, old man C. Case I worked gratis. The old man didn't even throw me a fish. I'd been at a sailing over to West Side Pier, seeing a friend off. I hung around the docks for a while, walking off the champagne and canopies and wondering what there is about a lonesome river at night that makes the little man inside you cry. Well, about that time, Father Neptune decided to take my thoughts off me and transfer them to a mermaid and a drink. A drowning mermaid, the way it sounded. Where are you? Over here. I can't swim. Oh, December is a great month for a dip into the river if you're a polo bear, but in I went. Hey, hey, grab a hold of me. Oh, 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 hey, I didn't play a stranglehold. Cooperate your rescue, lady, or I'll have to. Okay, much as I hate to. On the pier, it took time to bring her to. I worked her arms, pump handle style, and water sprayed from her oh. like a fountain. She finally came around to join the battle of the sexes. You hit me. To break your stranglehold. It's in the book. What book? How to save hysterics from drowning themselves and the rescuer. Oh. You didn't have to hit me so hard. Oh, my jaw. Feel the welt. Hmm. Got my brand on it now. B.C. B.C.? Barry Craig. The initial man's ring I'm wearing left initials on your jaw. <laughs> You're crazy. And cold. Yeah, me too. Pray it's pneumonia. Well, why that? There's no cure for a cold. So? There's a cure for pneumonia. Penicillin. You are crazy. You want an ambulance? Definitely not. A uh, police wagon? Don't you dare. Then what? Uh, your place? Is that proper? How can I know? We've only just met, Barry. We got into dry things. And properly enough to rate a good conduct medal from the mayor. I got a hard, square look at my mermaid. Okay, a face and a figure that makes truck drivers water their whistles. Um, Penny, for your thoughts. I'm wondering. About? How many lies you're going to tell before you tell the truth. <sighs> no more than I can help, I promise. Your name? Susan Lane. What made you go for a swim? But I can't swim. That's what I mean. I, I, I fell into the river by accident. I, uh, I was walking and my foot caught in a loose board on the pier and... Start all over again. I wasn't pushed in. No? No. Fact is, I jumped in. Why? I'm like that. Peculiar. I get fed up with things. Things like... Oh, nothing special, just life, men, the way the world is. I just get an uncontrollably morbid impulse and then I'm sorry. What if nobody happens along to save you for the next impulse? Goodbye, Susan Lane. She wasn't much. Oh, excuse me. Hello? Hello. Have I got the right party? Have you? 
Well, I mean, are you the Joe who pulled the blonde out of the drink? The name isn't Joe. I followed you to your joint, white guy. And my phone number? Your name's in the bell, Barry Craig, and your number's in the book. I see. Are you interested in hearing what I got to tell you? I've heard nothing so far. Well, open your ears, stupid. Hey, don't believe anything the dame tells you. I don't. What'd she tell you so far? That dill pickles make her hiccup. Okay, be a dope. All right. She said she'd attempted suicide. Baloney. She was tossed into the drink, picked up off the ground and thrown to the fish. You know that? I saw. Where do you fit into this? We won't go into that. Another thing. Paste this song title in your hat. Sugar Loaf Mama. Sugar Loaf Mama? It's number one in the jukebox, you stupid. Where do you spend your nights? Standing up in a closet to improve my posture. Well, the song's the key to the whole deal with a girl. Now, make like a detective. Come by. I made like a detective with Susan. All right, I did lie. Somebody attempted my life. Who? Oh, he wore a mask. Then why? I don't know. Oh, we're sure making progress. I can't tell you what I don't know. I suppose I might as well skip asking, uh, who was with me on the telephone? Skip asking me. The song, Sugarloaf Mama. What about it? It's a huge, popular success. I heard. I work for the music publisher who owns it. I'm his stenographer. The publisher owns it, you say? Did the publisher also write the song? Yes, but that's something now in, in dispute. Between whom? Mr. Sampson, the publisher, my boss, and a songwriter, Mervyn Marlowe. They're fighting a lawsuit over the song rights, over the profits. And uh, you come in where? I'm a witness for Mr. Sampson. Testifying to what? That my boss never personally received a song submitted by Mervyn Marlowe, that it's our firm policy to return unsolicited manuscripts unopened. Who's telling the truth? Your boss, Sampson, or this Marlowe? You ask a lot of questions. One of them may be trying to murder you. Yes, I know. Don't you care? Do you? What if I do? Then you'll protect me and worry about me. Now, I want to get back into my clothes and go home. Oh, here. You're dead. The radiator steam dried them. Use the kitchen. Thanks. And uh, don't forget this. This? Oh, my ring. Hey, quite a rock. Don't be fooled. It's only a cheap Mexican diamond. I'd never believe it. A lightning change of wardrobe, and we were on the street, arm in arm, like we've been engaged since the high school prom. Call a cab, Barry. Taxi! Hey, taxi! Want the company going home? I was wondering when you'd ask me. Get in. Don't try it, cousin. Huh? You just say something? I said stay out of my cab. Now, wait a minute. Oh, you were going to make a quarrel out of it? That was before your gun. Barry! The gun pointing at me, Susan. Yeah, relax, lady. All you stand to lose is his company. What's my loss? Skin. Off the top of your head. Now, I want ten minutes before you phone the cops. One favor, please. What? Do it to me over here, close to the left ear. What's a gag? You're not the first to take a liking to my head. Oh. Uh, the rest of your head's still sore, huh? And unhealed. Uh, if you're going to. Yeah, close to the left ear. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you fall down and you get up. You're still the same guy, except that your legs have aged ten years and your hat doesn't fit. While looking for a phone booth, I put one and one together. My anonymous caller and the kidnapping cab driver add up to one guy, the same guy. Hello. Give me Lieutenant Trav Rogers, please. You got him, Craig. Oh, well, your voice is changing, Trav. Should I worry? Over losing a squeaky soprano? It's official. What about? Mayhem in December. I found a girl and lost her. Sad. I can refer you to a Lonely Hearts Club. A torpedo masquerading as a hacky put the snatch on her. More facts, please. Susan Lane. Five feet two. Blonde. Blue eyes. 
Wrinkled dress that needs ironing. A wrinkled dress. Stop prying into my inner life. The hacky, so-called, was heavy set, meat-faced, with uh, jowls like Pluto the dog. A brown and white taxi cab. Did you get the license number? No, no. I was about to when I uh, fell down and hurt my head. You were assaulted? If there's a law against slugging confidential investigators. There isn't. We had our decorations for it here at headquarters. What danger is the girl in? Catching a cold. Catching a cold? A permanent cold. Send out a general alarm, Trav. She's too beautiful to die. Who isn't? Uh-uh, no. No personality. Goodbye now. Eli Sampson, music publisher, occupied a building that looked like an inferiority complex. Calcimine streaks for paint. Outside windows with the dust of ages on them. And a broken down staircase that made you feel like a dinosaur walking on eggs. The staircase was going to loom big in my future, as I soon found out. The first warning I had was a shot. Correction, two shots, and then a yell from an upper lantern. A yell of bloody murder enough to freeze me in my tracks. I stood still automatically in the middle of the staircase, and that was my murder. undoing. Murder. What sounded like a stampeding herd was coming smack at me. Stop him! Stop him! Stop him! Him was a wild-eyed maniac who looked like he jumped out of the street. Out of my way, you. I'd love to oblige, but narrow like the staircase is for bottleneck. I said out of my way. I'll need time to shift to reverse. Let me do it for you. <laughs> Located in the world with splinters of railings stuck in me like toothpicks. And a guy standing solemnly over me. A janitor holding a mop and a soap bucket. A janitor out of a Max Senate comedy. Blowing mustache and dressed in the top half of a cutaway. With a battered derby on his head. A, a brown derby. You seem fully recuperated, my boy. Not recuperated, only recovered. What was that railing tied together with? Pieces of string? Iron glue. I myself performed the repairs. Here, I'll help you up. Oh, don't bother. What are you made up for? You refer to my elegance? To the mop and the bucket. A oh, temporary condition, my boy. The mare is down. The mare is up. Up being? Ducks and bond. Oh. I fluctuate as it fluctuates. You're uh, staring at me? Yeah, trying to place you. I've seen that odd kisser of yours before. Along the stock exchange, perhaps? No, no. Who did all that shouting on the upper landing? It was me, summoning help. Who got shot? One Eli Sampson. The miscreant fugitive who butted you so unceremoniously. You'll get nuts in your tongue, Le Man. Mind if I leave you for Sampson? Uh, not at all. I'm in no mood to be interviewed today. The market uh, is down. <laughs> I found Samson in his office, fluttering his eyelids. Oh, oh, How do you feel? Dead, dead. That makes you a talking corpse. You got a career in vaudeville ahead. Oh, that maniac Mervyn Marlowe murdered me. Yeah. Burned your left wrist a little. Only a flesh wound. Not much damage for two point-blank pistol shots. Oh, I'll lose the arm. I'm sorry to disagree. Well, then it's a miracle. Yeah. Music publishers never die. They just fade away. Oh, here's the gun used on you. It was thrown down. Yes, that's the gun the maniac terrorized me with. Give it to me. It's evidence for the district attorney. I'll keep the gun a while. But... I'm a licensed detective. This Mervyn Marlowe is a songwriter battling you in the courts? A songwriter? A song thief? He didn't write Sugarloaf Mama? Lies. His claims are lies. Mervyn Marlowe can't even write his own name. He can't shoot straight. That makes him kind of useless all around. Uh, Samson. Yes, yes. A girl, Susan Lane. Susan Lane, my stenographer? Your late stenographer, maybe. She's been kidnapped. Kidnapped? By whom? A tough. Hired by Mervyn Marlowe. What motive would Marlowe have? To shut her up. To stop her from testifying to the truth when we go to court. The truth being? That nobody here read his song manuscript or even opened the envelope. How big is Marlowe's temptation to murder? Come on, Samson, don't shy at boasting. Sugarloaf Mama is a gold mine. Sales and sheet music alone run over $100,000. Motive of plenty to keep Blondie from testifying at all costs. He'll kill Susan. You'll find her dead. Where do I find Mervyn Marlowe? In a garret in East Harlem, uh, 3601 First Avenue. 
A crazy bohemian in a cold water garret with a piano. 3601 First Avenue. Call yourself an ambulance. Let that wound infect and you'll be the one-armed wonder of the music publishing business. Before quitting the building, I looked up Lemaire, the janitor. I found him in the basement, washing up. Welcome to my humble quarters, my boy. Try your face. I've got something to discuss. Proceed. You uh, clean the offices as well as the halls? Yes. The mockery of it. Being able to use your master key as you are, you're no doubt well familiar with the contents of the offices? I am after a fashion, that is. And uh, after a fashion... Uh, also familiar with the contents of the uh, desk? Do I detect an innuendo that I snoop? You detect. Face and reprehensible slander, my boy. As of this moment, consider our discussion terminated. This gun. Have you ever seen it before? You've seen it in Samson's office, maybe? Okay, so we're going to play close now. Is this your locker? I asked, is this your locker? It is. Open it. Why? I want to total up the stamps, the scotch, clips, and rubber bands. Uh, your day's haul, a man. You dare accuse me of the pettiest of thievery? Yeah, I dare. You see, I uh, placed your odd kisser where I'd seen it before, that is. The south of France, was it? The uh, rogues' gallery, it was. Weldon Le Maire, alias the Baron. And what snatching ladies' handbags, if not their petty thievery? Shh, not so loud. I lose face with the building management. Tell me what I want to know. Yes. I have seen this precise pistol before. Where? In Mr. Sampson's desk drawer. The uh, bottom left drawer, if my memory serves. Uh, you've cost me a pretty piece of change. Mm, a blackmail you could have wrung out of Sampson. So it's Sampson's own gun, huh? The old reprobate shot himself? The old reprobate sure did. Visiting the rundown garret the songwriter Mervyn Marlowe lived in, I got a smell of trouble even before I asked in. Who's there? I didn't need X-ray vision to know a crackpot songwriter on the other side of the door was healed with a gun. Who's there? I want to talk to you, Marlowe. The door's unlocked. Come in. Come in and nod hello to a gun. An old familiar situation. I came in, but with a bang. Oh! Marlow was out cold with his fingers coiled around a gun. A gun I relieved him of. He came to cursing himself. Uh, you Stand away from the door the next time you invite a fly into the web, sucker. Oh, you dirty You no. won't make out. When you find it monotonous, tell me. Samson used his own gun on himself. Uh, you will know that? I don't go for a gag as obvious as Samson's frame. Now get up, behave, and fill in the facts. Samson asked me to call on him for a talk. We had an argument. Samson said if I didn't drop my lawsuit, he'd de scandalize me as a mad dog murderer. I socked him one on the jaw, and Samson grabbed a gun out of a desk drawer. And? He said he'd frame me if I didn't sign papers swearing my claims to Sugarloaf Mama were a fraud. He said he'd swear the gun was mine and that I'd come in to kill him. That he'd overpowered me and seized the gun after I'd fired at him. When I ran out, Samson fired two shots, not at me. At himself. He gave himself a flesh wound. Ah, that's Samson all over. Anything for a buck. A hundred thousand bucks. Money belonging to me. He stole my song. You'll have your day in court. Yeah, with Samson's lying stenographer perjuring herself with a boss. Now that we're down to her, where is she? Where is she? What are you talking about? Susan Lane was kidnapped. Now what frame of... You and Samson are the interested parties. If she was for Samson, she was against you. So? So only you'd have a motive in shutting off her testimony, it would appear. If you arrange the snatch, Marlowe, you're a sucker. Get out from under while you can. Ring off. I had nothing to do with it. How about an attempt on her life on the docks? Nope. You're incapable of it? I'm capable of it, but I didn't do it. You own a hat? Sure, why? Get it. I'm taking it to headquarters. What for? You'll only land on the floor again. Protect you against yourself. That wild gleam in your eye belongs under temporary lock and key. I spent years writing a song, picking my brains, days, nights, starving in this filthy infested hole. So that swindler Samson... That's just what I mean. The 
prior night you're cooking at, you've got to explode. If you're really innocent of anything so far, I want to keep you that way. Walk in front of me. At police headquarters, Lieutenant Trav Rogers had sensational news. Susan Lane, we think we found her. Where? A shack up near Gun Hill Road overlooking the railroad yard. But uh, how? Let's go get her, shall we? I'll tell you how another time. It was Susan Lane on the attic floor of a seedy-looking frame dwelling, trussed hand and foot and dead to the world. She's asleep. Here's how we were tipped to a whereabout. The telephone? The receiver's off the hook. The girl squirmed enough to roll against it and knock the receiver off. The operator became suspicious and called police? Right. Help me untie her, Trev. I've got a pocket knife. Hey, Susan, wake up. Uh, Susan, it's uh, me, Barry. Uh, oh, she seems dopey. An overdose of sedatives, I'd say. See how many pupils in her eyes yeah. dilated? Somebody figured that the sleep, she couldn't make a disturbance. Where am I? In the arms of the law, baby. I've never seen you this romantic, Craig. Oh. I've always had a soft spot for struggling stenographers. Let's all ride downtown now, huh? Riding downtown on the West Side Highway with Trev Rogers thumbing his nose at speed laws, Susan came around to 100% of herself to uh, meet against me contentedly, uh, purring like a kitten. Oh, I feel so good. You're making Trav's bachelorhood an awful load to bear. Hand holding will only get your palms sweating, Don Juan. Hmm. Suppose we talk about the case, Craig. You talk. Samson and Marlo, one of them hired the kidnapper. What could Samson's motive be? Same motive he had in shooting himself. Frame and discredit Marlowe in advance of that trial over that song. Possibility. But you don't buy it? Not right away. Oh, uh, take that exit and pull up to Pier 41. What for? It's the pier where the case began. Began for me. Some clue you missed there? Uh, reconstruct the crime. Isn't that standard approved routine? All right, Brain. Pier 41. Susan. Uh, yes? Follow me. I'll, I'll need your help. All right. It uh, began about here. I heard a cry for help. Uh, is this about where you were when a mass somebody threw you into the river? Was yes, I think so. Good. Now, let's reenact it. Uh, stand facing the river. Uh, yes. I'm the masked mister. I steal up behind you, grab a hold. <laughs> Don't be ticklish. <laughs> I hoist you into the air, so... Oh, no! Craig, do you have to be that realistic? Oh, I have to be. How else can I heave a cute little bundle oh. like Susan into the drink? Ah! Craig, you maniac, she can't swim. Oh, can't she? But you saved her life in the first place. Yeah, that's what she wanted me to think. That was the hook, and I swallowed it. She can't swim, huh? Look at that Australian crawl. She swims like a fish. Yeah, good old will to self-preservation. I was counting on that to convict her. What was her game? Dramatize herself. Big. Make out her life was being attempted. To bleed Samson for a big slice of those song profits. More than she's already got. Already got? But she climbs back on the pier, gander at a hunk of so-called Mexican jewelry she's wearing. To praise the ring of Tiffany. And find out what a bonanza stenography can be for a smart girl. Samson gave her the ring? A down payment for her perjury. But if the blackmail was set up so good, why embellish it with phony attempts on her life and the kidnapping? Fear, fear. Marlowe could gun for her for lying for Samson. Ditto Samson to keep her from telling the truth. The truth being that Marlowe wrote Sugarloaf Mama. So? So by making herself a police problem, or my problem, that is, she scared Samson and Marlowe from daring to harm her. Clever. Here she comes. Oh, hello, baby. Oh, that was contemptible of you, Barry. A flaw in my cap. I'm so sorry. Uh, just by the way, who was the atrocious kidnapper? Oh, my, my brother. Why, oh, I'm cold. Well, where do you suggest we go? Uh, your place? No, it really wouldn't be proper this time. Uh, I'd be pinched for uh, 
sequestering police traffic. Case solved. Only Trev Rogers didn't let me just walk away from it. At his insistence, I had to drag down to headquarters to hunt and peck away at a typewriter. How's your detailed police report coming along, Barry? I'll be a month at it the way I type. Hmm, sad. Why are we so suddenly, uh, so, uh, so clerical? Regulation. Section 6, paragraph 4, governing confidential operatives. State. Spare me. But why in such a confounded hurry? Why right away tonight? I've got flight tickets for St. Nick's. Susan Lane's under arrest. Thanks to you. I can't just book her. Not without a precise stipulation of charges. Then get me a competent typist. <laughs> Sorry, they've all gone home. Patience, Barry. Just put one word after another. Hmm. Or less for a case I worked without a fee yet. Oh, by the way. What? Speaking of fees, the fact is Miss Lane was uh, uh, sporting enough to worry about that. Are you kidding? No, no, I'm not. She said you were working for her, even though it did boomerang for her. She hates to see you go empty-handed, she says. Sweet of her. Isn't it? Lacking fun, she gave you her dearest possession, her finest jewel, this, uh, this ring. Hey. My Trev, the rock's worth five G's if it's a penny. I'm sure. And now, if you'll uh, hand it back. Hand it back? What for? Regulations governing extorted property. <laughs> the girl, unfortunately, came by the ring uh, dishonorably. <laughs> you kill yourself. <laughs> Good night, folks. See you next week. You have been listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story, Song of Death, was written by John Robert. Next week, it's the strange story titled Death of a Private Eye, about which Barry Craig has this to say. Next week, I'm hired to help a man pay a visit, but discover instead that my client has a visitor first. That visitor being death. See you next week, folks. Featured in the role of Susan was Amzi Strickland. Barry Craig, starring William Gargan, was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is Don Pardo speaking. Now enjoy Meredith Wilson's Music Room on NBC.